I'm trying to get harder and tougher mentally and physically every day of my life. You're either the growth mindset or you're the fixed mindset. If you're trying to be the best, you need to look at who the best is and see what they do. Relentless pursuit of progress. There's a difference between the best and the rest and the rest. Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast. Champions are built in the mind first. Where we interview scientists, world champions, doctors and experts in just about every area of health and fitness. What do you care enough about? What are you fascinated enough about to go so deep and learn so much that you'll know more about it than anyone else? And now here's your host, Michael Cashew. Hey, this is Michael Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I've got Aubrey Marcus on the show. Aubrey is the founder and CEO of Onnit, which is one of the fastest growing companies in the world. Uh, Joe Rogan is his business partner, which is super cool. Aubrey is really well known for a term he coined, which is total human optimization, and he lives it. This dude is dialed in in every sense of the word, and one of those things that he's been dialing in for many years is sex. And so while I admire Aubrey for a lot of different things in the way that he lives his life, I think that sex is one of the things that is most compelling. And what I found over the past few years is that the podcasts that do the best on this show are the ones where a D and I are talking about relationships and sex. And so um, I've been super excited to dive in with someone that I, I look up to as an expert or someone that just really knows a lot about it. Um, so we talk about how he learned about sex growing up and how his views have evolved over time. We talk about his book, Own the Day, and in it, he has a chapter on more sex and better sex. So we talk about the benefits of having more sex as if you need to be convinced, how to have better sex, including the difference between what I call fast food versus gourmet sex. Not what I call it. I got that from uh, the well-fucked woman. I think it's, it was called the, the podcast. We talk about BDSM games like those from 50 Shades of Grey and some others that he talks about in his book. We talk about the one week sex challenge in his book and how he recently took a vow of celibacy. We talk about why he's doing that and what he's learning in the process. Aubrey and a lot of his guests have been so open in talking about this topic on his show, the Aubrey Marcus podcast. And it was such a pleasure for me to get to dive deep with him on it myself. This podcast is great for you, whether you're struggling in your sex life or you have an amazing sex life and really want to level it up. So without further ado, please help me welcome Aubrey Marcus. This episode is also brought to you by Jumbo CBD. If you're not already on the CBD train, then I'm sure you've at least heard of it before because many people thought in the beginning that this was just a legal way to get high. And unfortunately for some of you, you can't get high on CBD. You can try, but you can't get high on it. On the other hand, it can help you sleep better. It can reduce stress and anxiety. It can be huge for pain relief and reducing inflammation. Personally, I've had knee pain for about five years now, and I haven't been able to figure out a way to get rid of it. I haven't, I haven't figured out the root cause. I've worked with PTs and chiropractors, and I just haven't been able to eradicate it. So I have used some pain relieving techniques, and this is one of them. I've used Jumbo's Extra Strength um, 200 milligram balm, and it absolutely does not completely take the pain away, but it makes it manageable. Uh, it allows me to get in a, into a deeper squat. It allows me to walk around and just go about my daily activities without feeling much pain at all. And whether that's placebo or not, I really don't care because I just don't feel like I'm in as much pain. I've also used their sprays and there's a really subtle 
relaxing effect to the sprays. Um, so that's, that's pretty great. Uh, it's helpful for sleep and reduces a little bit of like a feeling of tension in my chest, which I often call anxiety. Uh, it's great for af- athletes and recovery and some specifics. And what sets Jumbo apart is that they have a hundred percent natural ingredients, full spectrum CBD sourced from Colorado and Oregon. Uh, they have CO2 extracted oils that are, I think, safer. Uh, they're, they have therapeutic grade essential oils in a lot of their products, third party lab tested. So it's legit. And they're one of the first CBD companies to post their lab results publicly. Uh, I also know the owners of this company very well. They're very close friends of mine and I trust them deeply. Uh, again, my favorite product of theirs is the 200 milligram extra strength balm. I've also used the sprays, but they also have drops and butters or ghee. I think ghee is like a, a butter type thing. Um, so there's all sorts of different products and they're offering you 15% off of anything in their store. And you can get access to that by going to jambocbd.com and use the code brute in all caps. That's B R U T E in all caps. Uh, a couple more things. So a huge plus of their sprays and drops is that they use MCT oil. So since CBD is a fat soluble molecule, it binds with this oil and allows for much more rapid and effective absorption of the actual CBD. It also has essential oils that add flavor and they bring their own proven health benefits as well. With the muscle bomb, since they they use ghee as the base, again, ghee is like a butter type thing. The CBD is binding with the ghee fat and it's able to be carried all the way to the bones. Ghee itself has amazing topical healing properties and when CBD is added, the results can be pretty profound. So again, you can get access to this discount, 15% off of all of their products by going to jambocbd.com and enter the code B-R-U-T-E, all caps, at checkout. Go get them. Aubrey, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, man. Happy to be here. I've been a longtime fan, and I've specifically looked up to you um, for the way that you show up as a man. You're, you're so courageous and bold with your kind of self-expression, the way that you do fitness, the way that you show up in relationships. And so it was kind of difficult for me to kind of, um, I don't know, dwindle, dwindle this down to one topic, but mm-hmm. given your recent practices in celibacy. I, th- I think sex is a Practice great place. Is the key word. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a great topic for us to dive into. Sure. Um, like I was telling you, the podcast that I've done on relationships and sex have been the most popular that I've ever done. So I think this will really resonate with people. Great. Yeah. So, happy to talk about it. So let's start out with uh, how you learned about sex. I learned about sex like most people learn about sex through porn. You know, my dad had porn collections on like Betamaxes Mm -hmm. and I found out where the stash was and my older stepbrothers, we'd go raid the stash and then we'd look at it and I didn't really know what it was, but it seemed naughty and it seemed like interesting. So I kind of figured it out. Uh, Magazines that I would find around and, and things like that. I mean, we didn't have the internet back then. So it wasn't the same way that the kids are these days where you can just go to Pornhub on your phone or something like that. Like we had to find a stash, Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know. Um, But, you know, my parents were really liberal and open about discussing it. But it's just not something that a kid really wants to talk about, talk to their parents about. Not that they wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, I mean, most of it was just from, you know, finding porn somewhere and then trying to figure it out. But that's not what gave sex its meaning and that that just kind of showed me what it was well at least that pornographized version of sex but what gave it its meaning was a variety of different things that i'm sure we'll get into if we're going to talk about my attempts at celibacy Mm -hmm. i had just about the same exact experience i was probably eight years old and i climbed up i was playing hide and seek and I, i climbed up above my parents shower and I discovered not only my Christmas presents, so I learned that Santa was fake, <laughs> but I also found the an even porn better Christmas stash. present. Exactly, man, <laughs> best day of my life. Yeah. Um, so I learned about sex in in about the same exact way. My parents, I've never had a discussion with my father about that. Is there a way that you think, or how how do you think the best way for your dad to have approached sex would have been? You know, I think it's just, it's, it's weird when you make it weird, 
you know, and I think that's part of this whole thing with sex in our culture is like we make it this stigmatized, you know, there's a lot of religious shame. There's a lot of other stuff. It should just be discussed like an ordinary part of life. Mm. You know, like if we go back to our tribal roots, people having sex would be something that you would see and hear and it would be something that would be happening around you and be like, oh, they're having sex. Just like if you go, you know, out to uh kenya and you see two zebras fucking or you go out to like a, a ranch and you see two you know a bull and a heifer having sex like it's not like you're like oh my god you know it's mm-hmm. like oh wow there's the red rocket that's or whatever nature. that's like weird it's nature you know i, I mean i watched like uh, kangaroos have sex when i was in a in australia right like it's just normal it's just like a normal thing and i think for us to understand that humans having sex is a natural and normal thing I think is really important and I think that can come within the family and it also hopefully gets reinforced by society where it's just we just take some of the pressure off and so it's not this big you know huge scary you know taboo thing it's Mm. just part of life and then we can talk about how to actually okay like the porn is one way to activate certain levels of you know excitement particularly like visual stimulation through these different acts and through these power exchanges and whatever else is going on in the in the porn but like here's another way to actually use sex to deepen connections and like deepen intimacy bonds and like here's let's have a discussion not just about the act and how to do it better but like what it can mean and what it doesn't have to mean sometimes it can be just pleasure and sometimes Mm. it can be some kind of more intimate bond and just really just cover the spectrum about what it could be and just but not do it in a weird way like not have to be like okay we're gonna have a discussion about sex Mm -hmm. now you know Mm -hmm. it's like no it's just out there and it might start out that way right it might start out feeling like super fucking uncomfortable and then it gets easier as it becomes not weird anymore so that's that's how you learned about sex how did your uh tell, tell me a little bit about the journey of your evolution and thinking about sex well to me you know i I mean older stepbrothers and and a lot of family dynamics to me like really the measure of a man was how what girl he had and how he performed in bed you know and that was something that was ingrained in me early and i even in one of my newsletter diaries um i told the story of i remember very clearly and i was in fourth grade and obviously you don't do anything in fourth grade except hold hands and maybe like peck your girl on the lips Mm -hmm. you know right I guess some people do more, but not not, me, not in my school. So anyways, I was dating, uh, dating. I was together with this girl named Ashley and this guy named Todd was with the girl named Amy. And Amy was like the, the girl in fourth grade. Right? And I was like crushing it in all the sports and I was crushing it in all the academics and all the school projects and school play, like whatever the, whatever the fuck. I was like, I was killing it. But Todd had Amy. And Amy was the girl. So Todd was the man. Mm. Like if Todd kissed Amy in the bathroom, like the whole school, even the, even like the fifth graders would be excited about it. So I very quickly learned that no matter, wh- no matter what I was doing, like the guy with the best girl mm-hmm. was the best guy. He was the most popular guy. He was the guy who got the most love and admiration. And even for me, I was the most envious of him, you know, even though I could beat him at pretty much everything else. Mm-hmm. But he had Amy. You know, so that was something that was just kind of constantly reinforced is that the measure of myself as a man is dependent upon my girl and my girl staying with me. This was the second part. My girl staying with me and being happy with me was dependent upon my ability to please her in bed. So those two different, you know, falsehoods really, but that are societally reinforced, those led to, you know, some deep challenges down the road that I've had to spend a lot of time unwinding. Mm Mm-hmm. So in your book, Win the Day, you Own the have, Day. Own the Day. I'm sorry. That's embarrassing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I actually yeah. remember uh, looking it up on Amazon recently and uh, yeah, I found that. Anyway, um, <laughs> you have a chapter called More Sex, Better Sex. Yeah. Let's talk about both. So what do you think of most people's excuse? And this is usually only the, this is only a problem for people in some sort of long-term relationship. I think like people in a new relationship are trying to have sex all the time Mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, and then when we get to know someone and we start to take them for granted, we assume they're always going to be there. And then we tend to have less and less sex. What do you think of the excuse of, I just don't have time to have more sex? 
yeah, it's nonsense. It's just putting some other reason why because they don't want to look at, well, and it's hard to even look at the actual reasons why. And I think if you really want to understand what happens to sexuality in long-term monogamous relationships, I think Dr. Wednesday Martin's work in her book, Untrue, is really the best research that I've seen to date. And you can follow her or you can follow um, Whitney Miller, who's my former partner. She has a podcast with Wednesday Martin called True Sex and Wild Love. And I recommend listening to that because there's an amazing amount of science about what happens to males and females in monogamous partnerships. So for females, it's actually the women that start to lose sexual interest a lot faster than men. Mm -hmm. Men kind of have a curve where it goes up really high and then it kind of levels off, but it kind of stays leveled off. Like the guys kind of constantly on the aggregate, of course, like mm -hmm. there's exceptions mm -hmm. to every rule, but this is took looking at studies that study like massive amounts of people. So usually a guy, you know, their, their desire increases, spikes, and then it lowers, but it doesn't like fall off a cliff, right? It like stays at a certain point where they're always pretty much kind of down to keep having sex. Mm -hmm. Um, again, in the aggregate. And then women, though, they have that same curve, that same excitement curve where everything, you just want to have sex all the time, limerence or new relationship energy. Limerence. Where, limerence is when you just get together with somebody mm -hmm. and everything's exciting and you just want to take their clothes off all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's like the scene in every movie where you like pin someone up against the door right. and you're like, whoa, like I just, I'm intoxicated by you, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that phase and everybody goes through that and that can last however long, six months, two years, three years, whatever, there's a certain kind of curve of that phase. But then women's sexual desire just drops off a cliff. And interestingly, biologically, you know, I think there's a lot of explanations why you can look at some evolutionary biology in which people who really live together in that kind of bond were typically family members. So that might be triggering some familial response that's trying to um, you know, avoid, like help you avoid sleeping with your family, right, or right. it could be some familiarity, or it could be just the desire to get different genetics as far as for your, your offspring so that you're spreading, you're making the most maximum amount of combinations. Like there's a lot of different theories about why, but you can just study the data and find out that in these monogamous pair bonds, sexuality really drops. And a lot of it has to do with women are just not that into it. I've never had this thought before now, but it, I think part of the key, tell me what you think about this. Part of the key to having more sex, especially the longer you're in a relationship is actually having better sex. Because if you're not, if you're just having, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, if you're having fast food sex constantly, where you just take the clothes off and you get right to it, then that's going to become unsatisfying for both people. And by having better sex, by courting each other and having novel experiences, we're going to make it more likely that both of us are going to want to have more sex. Totally. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that completely because then it becomes, so I think there's a couple ways to do it. One is, you know, the novelty actually can create, uh, can create excitement. It's what creates excitement in the new part of a relationship anyway. Mm -hmm. So if you can create novel scenarios in your sexuality, and that doesn't mean, and some of that could be like changing, having like doing some role play where you really commit um, and switching that around, um, sometimes it's just go into another room it could be yeah it could be it could be as simple as that it could be you know some deeper layered power exchanges where you're playing different characters mm -hmm. where someone is dominant someone is submissive it could be there's a variety of different things that you can do to like keep changing it up and and use different novel energies and experiences and i talk about that a bit in my book as well uh, and that's, there's a lot of really good science about like what happens, especially in the power exchange dynamic mm -hmm. where yeah, we're going to go people, there in a second. people in the dominant, people in the dominant role, uh, experience flow state and people in the submissive role experience transient hypofrontality, which is like a loss of time and space. Wow. Plus the pain endorphins then can turn into pleasure endorphins. And it becomes a very interesting dynamic if you start layering in these things. It's not for everybody, you know, but it's just something that, you know, if you're in a longer term relationship, you can explore and play around with and just, you know, see, and just that can definitely keep things fresh. Um, the other thing is you can also develop a more spiritual practice, you know, where you're actually engaged in a more tantric practice where you're breathing together and you're like trying to like breathe out through the top of your head and you're synchronizing your breath and you're like forming a union and using breath particularly and to, to actually like bond yourself together and reach a heightened spiritual state through your sexuality. Um, both of those things I think can add in different elements that'll keep the sex feeling really like exciting and mm -hmm. like an integral part of your life. 
So I was talking to uh, your buddy Ian before the show about this, and we were talking about how it can be like in a long-term relationship as you start to, as this gets, it could become more challenging and difficult to have uh, an erotic life and, and have a bunch of novelty in your relationship. Um, and you want to have a bunch of sex. You want to make sure you're having as much sex as possible. And my go-to usually would just be to put it on the schedule. But there's something about putting something on a schedule that it immediately loses. It seem, seems to lose all eroticism. Mm. Um, you've been in a couple, at least a couple, really long-term relationships. What are your thoughts on that? How do you, well, how do you maintain have, that? I have, but you know, my last relationship was polyamorous, mm -hmm. which is a whole other category, which obviously there's massive emotional swings and it's i mean it's kind of like being in a in a half in a wood chipper and half in a wood chipper <laughs> and half in like you know ecstasy right mm -hmm. like cuz you're experiencing all these novel experiences and like all of these strong emotions but then you're also feeling all these negative emotions but learning from all those so it was a massive learning experience so i think you know saying that i was in a, a long-term relationship is true you know mm -hmm. i was with whitney for a long time um but it was also a little bit different you know sure. some different rules but to get to your idea of scheduling and you know whether you think that's a good idea i've experienced like if you're creating a scenario that's exciting like let's say you're gonna take a you're gonna play a role mm -hmm. you know like let's say um let's say let's say let's create a, let's create a scenario where like um the woman is a porn star and she's auditioning and trying to hire hire a male porn star to go and make a movie with her mm -hmm. right so like your girl is like you know the badass porn star and she's trying to audition people to see if they are good enough to be in her movie mm -hmm. you know so she's let's just say that's one dynamic let's say that works for the dynamic in right. the relationship you know so she's like so what do you got you know like blah 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 and you're setting this up and let's say that's exciting for both people and you have that on the schedule and you know that like thursday night you know you're going to play the role of joe you know joe bob the porn the porn guy right, and right. then your your girl or wife is going to play the role of you know the porn the the massive porn star is going to be auditioning you mm -hmm. and you guys both get excited about that and then the excitement for that because it's scheduled like you could get excited about that on if it's thursday you could get excited about that tuesday and then wednesday and then thursday could be like all you're thinking about is this this scenario that you're like excited about exploring and figuring out and um so i think that's a good way to schedule something mm -hmm. if it's something that's like oh fuck yeah i'm excited about this but if you're just scheduling like here we go again 7 p.m on so and so we got to figure this out like i would probably say that makes it obligatory and right. anything that's obligatory is something that people naturally have resistance towards yeah that's a great distinction um i i, I forget where i heard this analogy i think it was called the unfucked podcast or something the unfucked woman <laughs> podcast yeah. um she uses this analogy of fast food versus gourmet sex what do you think the role of both are and fast food sex is like just get down to it and gourmet sex is one of these more elaborate experiences where you're actually trying to um i don't know have a novel experience well i think sex can be a sex can be a reset uh, of sorts you know just like food can stop hunger i think sex can stop stress and it can stop mental loops so if you're stuck in like a little mental loop and you can't get out of your head and you're stressed about work and you're stressed or your girl's stressed or whoever whatever's happening um whoever whoever you are like if bringing in sex can be a great way to like pattern interrupt mm -hmm. and i think that's the place for fast food sex like you just want to pattern interrupt whatever state you're in and like do something and and i'm not talking about a quickie which could be really passionate and like you may be in a bathroom somewhere or you're like just got it you gotta only have a few minutes to before you got to get ready and go out mm -hmm. to dinner like that's a different thing i wouldn't call that fast food i would just call that like just some kind of passionate you know snack we'll have a glossary in the show yeah ex guys. exactly <laughs> but uh but i think like fast food sex would be just like very quick like just for the function and i think the function would be a pattern interrupt maybe to connect mm -hmm. you guys a little bit maybe to relieve alleviate stress maybe you know because the moment you have an orgasm if you're a guy or a girl you're in a different state you know like your mind is shifted your hormone states are shifted your stress patterns are shifted so i think that's the place for fast food and then there's the full-on gourmet let's take our time you know 
hour, two hours, whatever, do all these different things, whether it's all romantic or tantric or, you know, uh, fantasy based. Um, and then there's, you know, all the stops in between. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's dive further into gourmet sex. You already started to touch on it. Um, and you write about this in your book that the 50 shades of gray series, I think was bought more than all of the Harry Potter books combined. Something crazy <laughs> so, like yeah. that. I forget the stat, but it was like insane. So obviously there's this deep, deep underlying, um, thing in all of us or, or in so many people in our society that want to read this book and understand something inside of it. Um, yet there's so much taboo in the term BDSM. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about this a little bit? Well, I think that's why people want it so much mm -hmm. because there's been so much shame put around it. The more you make something like shameful, the more that people are naturally attracted to it. Don't do this. And everybody's like, okay, I want to do it. What is it? I want to do that. Mm -hmm. You know? So I think, I think it actually goes hand in hand together. Whereas it's like the more repressed, like, you know, you look at Japanese culture, right? They have pretty wild, you know, sexual expressions, but their culture in general, in the aggregate, obviously there's exceptions to everything, but in the aggregate is, you know, you're supposed to act in a very kind of um, conservative manner and their sexuality is really outlandish in a, in a general, in a general way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're looking at that and, and recognizing that those things are kind of part and parcel. And I think people's urge to express in this way is because of some of the repression that we felt. I think women have been shamed for, you know, their sexuality for far too long rather than celebrated words like slut and whore and all of these things have been, you know, cast upon just normal women who like sex, like all people should, like all humans should mm -hmm. like sex, but, but somehow men's jealousy and other women's jealousy about them sleeping with their men, whatever, men and women both are responsible for these, these words. But, you know, ultimately like that expression has created this desire to like reclaim that, you know, reclaim that word and reclaim that state of like, oh yeah, I want to be a slut. Like I actually want, let me be that, mm. you know, like let me be submissive. Let me just crave more sex, you know? And there's like a certain empowerment for actually like reclaiming that, um, that aspect. And I think for men, there's been a certain level of, you know, disempowerment as far as their ability to be really dominant. You know, it's always, there's this, and I think in general, that's good, you know, but I think there's natural urges to like be the savage mm -hmm. Conan, the barbarian, pick your woman up and throw her on the bed and like ravage her, you know, this kind of urge where that aspect of dominance has also been somewhat repressed and like a new kind of gentle male has taken over in the, the zeitgeist as a mm -hmm. priority. So, you know, kind of rebelling against that gentleness and being a little rougher and a little more dominant is something that we've had to, men, a lot of men have felt repressed. So this is just re releasing these natural levels of repression. And I think that's what's creating it. Now, again, as I said, though, there's also different levels of um, things that are happening when you engage in these practices, which are actually like hardwired into the human organism as well. So I think it's a combination of all those things. So how is dominance different than um, violence or using force, right? I, I, a lot of people that have never heard of Dom Sub or, or have just read it in a mag, read about it in a magazine or something like that. Um, I think one of their biggest hangups is it sounds like it could be like violence and unconsensual sex or non-consensual sex. How is it different? It's completely different. Yeah. I mean, I think when you're going into that space, you want to have absolute trust and like fear. If you're playing with fear, like actual fear, I think you're playing a really risky, really risky game. Mm -hmm. And it's not that some people don't like playing with that and like using that as like one of the tools. But to me, that's like a different category. What you really want and the best experiences are when there's absolute trust. And, and that trust means that at any given point, anybody can be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, like, let's stop the game. Like there always should be both a giggle and a, hey, whoa. Mm. like at any given moment in this thing like don't get so lost like recognize this is a game so like when you're approaching your partner like it's hey do you want to play this game we're mm -hmm. playing a game mm -hmm. and as soon as the game's over the game's over 
You know what I mean? So it's not like you carry on the game. And there is like, you can, and there's people who do carry on this dom-sub relationship outside of the bedroom and like extend it. That's a whole, that's a different category though as well. So these are like variations of the norm. But I would say, you know, the experience is best when you just understand that it's a game. You understand basically the scope of the game. And you really like constantly, if you're in the dom position, you want to constantly, you don't want to push so far that the game ends because Mm. then it's no fun. It's no fun for either person. Like, oh, I pushed, I pushed so far that the game is, I got so caught up in it that the game ends like okay good job Mm -hmm. like you played too hard with the toy now the toy's broken (laughs) you know like good fucking work you know like it's it's a terrible it's a terrible feeling when when you've done that and sometimes it can happen accidentally so both people have to that's why you have safe words forgive that yeah of course and just that dialogue i mean the idea of a safe word like you should be so tapped into your to your part your partner that Mm -hmm. you like you know Mm -hmm. like i mean like you know if it's like oh the energy shifted Mm. this is no longer like fun we're not playing a game this got serious and then as soon as it gets serious like game over you know like hug talk about it whatever whatever thing like be ready to throw the game away Mm. at any point and know that both people can throw the game away at any point you can always pick it back up another time you Mm. know but just go in play the game and you know have fun but you know and just know what the boundaries are and just really read each other like stay tapped in Like avoid the impulse to act out your fantasies at the other person's um, expense and try to co-create a mutual experience that'll that'll fit the sweet spot where you're both activating both of those things. Because if you push too far, you're going to feel bad. If, you know, if the other person pushes too far, you know, it's just, it's not going to work out. Right. I love in the book that you have a seven day sex challenge. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about some of the specifics that you kind of outline about Dom sub stuff and just give people some things that they might be able to try. So in the book, guys, if you're listening and gals, um, he basically, Aubrey challenges you to a seven day sex challenge, um, to basically try seven things, one each day. And he says you can read different books, websites, whatever. And he also talks about some specific ways to practice um, dominant and submissive practice. So first off, you say delayed gratification. What does that mean? Well, that means it's basically teasing, right? And both people, and once once again, also like it just the male doesn't have to be the dom Mm -hmm. and the female doesn't have to be the sub like it can be either way and you can also be switch and Mm -hmm. like play both roles and try it out and like i encourage people like i encourage any guy who's going to be a dom like be a sub feel what it's like like understand like what boundaries feel like Mm -hmm. and don't be like if you're going to put you know if if someone else is going to do this for you like better do it yourself too and like feel what it's like like have that courage you know have that kind of confidence in yourself to make sure that you can you understand that you understand the game from both sides you know you understand what it's like to all right like i understand this game so i encourage people to do that but delayed gratification would be um let's say if you're a guy you're going down on a girl and or if it could be the other way let's say it's oral sex and the dominant person who's providing the oral sex let's say the dominant person is providing the oral sex so if you're a guy and you're the dom and you're going down on your on your girl um you could tell her you know not to come you're not allowed to come yet you know like you're not allowed to come and then you could um either trying to like push that boundary and then like reinforce verbally that they're not supposed to and then it becomes naughty and obviously usually that makes it actually even harder not to come right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or like you could just tease and like get somebody close and then pull away and then get somebody close again and then pull away and and so that'll create tension naturally how's this different than what one thing i we, we probably could have talked about in the beginning is um you know the our society is pushing so hard for gender equality in the workplace and different areas. But one thing that has happened is we've become, we've also pushed ourselves into more equality in the bedroom sexually. So we don't have as much polarity. Mm -hmm. So how does, how does someone think about being maybe bossed around like that in the bedroom? Why is that? Why is that? Okay. 
Well, I think it's, uh, I think polarity is what creates tension. Like the stronger the poles on a magnet, the more they're going to be drawn towards each other, mm -hmm. right? Like it's a natural phenomenon when you're talking about polarity. There's a, there's an energy between two poles that get, you know, they get far apart Two like pieces that are not, that don't have polarity. It'd be like sticking two rocks together, right? There's not a lot of tension, but if you get two magnets together, there's obviously going to be a lot of tension, um, that's going to be there and that energy is going to feel good. And again, this is a game. Like, remember, this is a game. This is like you're playing a game. And it's like you play the game, you know, like have fun with this. If you're getting bossed around and whatever you're doing, it has no bearing upon you in your regular life. Mm -hmm. Like you're playing a game. If I got cast as a role as a, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, a joker or a, a you know, uh, whatever, a daredevil or something in the, in a, in a play or in a movie. It doesn't mean I'm that person. Mm, that's you know, a great it means analogy. like, I'm like playing that role. Right. So like play the role, play the roles that are fun and then don't like, don't judge them and think about like, get out of your head. If you're in your head and bed, you're dead. Like right. get out of your head. This is a game, play the game, have fun and let it be a game. When the game's over, laugh about it. You can be laughing about it in the shower. You can laugh about it later. And it's just treat it as a game, like mm -hmm. have fun. Like it's not so fucking serious. So if you get, if you like being called names, get called names. It doesn't mean that those names are like going to carry over and they shouldn't carry over. If you, if you're doing things that are like really, if you're doing things that you normally wouldn't do fine, you're doing them in the game context. Mm -hmm. It's like Dr. Strange creating that, you know, like bubble reality where he can practice his spells mm -hmm. and nobody's going to get hurt. Like that's what you're doing. You're creating this little bubble reality where you can play out different ideas and expressions of yourself. And then after the game's over, the bubble reality collapses and you're back to normal reality. Yeah, I love the piece about getting out of your head because so many people are caught up thinking about what should be fun or what should be pleasurable rather than just going into it and having an experience. Right. So go in, have an experience. And if you love it, keep playing that game. If not, try another position. Sure. Yeah. And it'll change over time. You know, some things like the novelty will be there at the start and then, you know, it'll kind of fade away or maybe the game will get corrupted in some way. Like it just, it'll, it'll just shift a little bit and mm -hmm. you just be, a, be an observer of that. And I think having that dialogue with your partner too, just to be able to talk about it and just talk about what's going on. And I think there's just so much, again, just so much pressure on sex and sexual performance. And I think it forces people to like, ah mm -hmm. like you know the ego is so intimately woven into sexuality like nobody's the best in bed you right. know and being in a polyamorous relationship like really understanding that i desperately always wanted to be the best but being the best is not about like your skills or your attributes being the best is just about the connection with that person in the moment so like sometimes i've probably been the best and a lot of times i haven't mm -hmm. you know and with some people i've been the best some people i certainly haven't it's not like a it's not like a you know objective skill like an absolute thing like i am the best fuck off mm -hmm. no you're not mm -hmm. and anybody could be the best in that moment in that situation and and that's, so it's just taking taking all that pressure off like who is your best i don't know it just depends on a variety of different fucking things right you know, and I think just kind of trying to extricate the ego, which is judging ourselves based on our performance from the actual thing itself. So it can be fun again. Mm. Talk about restraint and pain a little bit. How yeah. can people use that? Well, I mean, I think these are just different ways to access um, that feeling of surrender, you know, and that feeling. I mean, the pain itself. And when you say pain, it shouldn't be something that's so painful that it's creating fear or contraction. Like I would recommend riding the line of like, only use as much as doesn't create a contraction because mm -hmm. as soon as you get a contraction then it's going to be harder to be in that expansive space and it should ultimately be pleasurable in some way yeah right? it should be right and, and it it should it will eventually you know transfer into pleasure mm -hmm. it'll kind of heighten the endor the general endorphin load and the mm -hmm. general intensity of this so it's just being mindful of how to use that whether it's spanking or whether it's whatever else you're doing um, just being mindful that you're not pushing and that you're also like metering it out. Like don't go straight, like super hard right out of the gate. Like just start like warming the, warming up and mm -hmm. like getting, mm -hmm. getting the body used to that. Cause the body adapts to the endorphins and then can handle more endorphins. And then there's certainly a point where it cannot handle the endorphins or fear gets triggered or like contraction gets triggered. Be mindful. Don't do that. Um, restraint is another thing. It's just that as a, 
a physical level of restriction that puts you in that submissive headspace and in that headspace that triggers a lot of those kind of mental phenomenons that we're talking about um obviously that's an act of trust you know like you really should deeply trust the person if you're being restrained so and you really have to establish that trust but even the you know practicing that trust it's a it's a it's a really exciting things anyways oh wow you trust me enough to let me tie you up Mm -hmm. you know like that in and of itself is exciting like even before even the sex starts like wow like it's rad that you trust me that much you know and that you're excited about trusting me that much that amplifies everything amplifies everything totally totally so i think that's the way to look at the way to look at that also just a pointer like when someone is restrained like just as a as kind of like a pro tip if someone is restrained you take it way easier on anything that's painful or anything like that because that feeling of being restrained and not being able to re- react mm-hmm. to anything that's happening that's like a it's an exponential multiplier so if you're restraining really take it easy spank a little lighter mm-hmm. or whatever whatever the thing is you're doing or get spanked a little lighter but like understand that restraint changes the dynamic in and of itself so if you're going to stack those two different modalities together then just be mindful do a half dose of each yeah half dose of each exactly yeah yeah don't go don't go well but i think stacking like restraint with pure pleasure is really good and then if you're going to use any kind of pain then having like free mobility is typically like the way that the way Mm -hmm. that i think it works best yeah and learn learn one skill at a time is probably a great great method right um what what is observation so that's when someone is doing something to please you based on like you're just watching them so it could be you know let's say the girl wants to watch you masturbate and you're just she's just sitting in the chair and you know you're in the light and she's in the dark and that's what you're doing or it could be the opposite Mm -hmm. right like where you're just allowing your partner to look at you um and get the pleasure from you visually pleasing them maybe it's you know or maybe it's a strip tease maybe it's a you know it could be any variety of things, but it's just intentionally giving pleasure because you can give pleasure to the body, but you can also give pleasure to the mind and to the eyes. So that would be kind of another way to just say like, no, I want you to, I would love, you know, I want you to do this Mm -hmm. and then have the person do that for you, which again will trigger all those kind of power exchange phenomena. Love it. So guys, those are four different things you can try in your seven day Mm -hmm. sex challenge. Um, Another great thing to do would be just to describe your different fantasies, your and your girls or your guys' totally. fantasies to each other, and then start to play around with those. You can go all in right off the bat, or you can just kind of dip your toe in. Even talking about them is going to be erotic. For like, sure. Talking about them is going to be really exciting. So especially if you haven't talked about them before, like just taking the time to talk about your fantasies is going to be really powerful. So on Oct- or November 3rd, you put out a, it was either a tweet or an Instagram post. Instagram post. That said, hey world, I'm giving up sex. Something like Indefinitely. that. Definitely. Tell me about that. What, what was going on? Well, I recognized that I had so, I had so much wrapped up into my, into sexuality that it was like, it meant so much to me still, you know, those old patterns that I was talking about, like the measure of myself as a man was dependent upon, you know, my sexual partners. And I was constantly judging myself on that. So what I didn't really realize was that it was not only the measure of myself, the, my worthiness as a man, but that was also tied into my love for myself. Because in the conditional love paradigm that we're all in, where we love ourselves because of X, I loved myself based upon the girl that I got. You know, me and Ashley versus Todd and Amy. Todd was better than me because he had Amy. So Mm -hmm. if I was loving myself based on how I was doing, I was only loving myself based upon the girl that I had and how happy she was and and et cetera. So I kind of recognized that and I was like, this is fucked, you know? And, And I think the open relationship, the polyamorous relationship really was like putting a lot of pressure on that situation because you're constantly having to like this isn't my girl you know even though like i want it to be my girl in some ways but it's not she's free to do whatever she wants and she's you know in my case like whitney fell in love with another guy and like had other guys that she was interested in and this constant like 
oh man, like I want, I like almost needed her to be mine, but I also needed to let her go. And it was just, just this kind of constant chaos and tension. It sounds like it. Yeah. And I was like, fuck it. Like I'm done. Like I can't do this anymore. Like I got to let it go. Um, and interestingly, like one of the ways that I would reinforce that I would reinforce that kind of paradigm would be to masturbate as well, because mm-hmm. I would masturbate in my head thinking about all the sexual experiences I've had or, or, you know, thinking about all the people I've had or even looking at other people and being like, oh, I could get that person, whatever. But it was still reinforcing the same paradigm. So it was like fucking cutting it all out and I'm going to see what happens. And it was really hard. The first few days were fine. And then by like day five, I was just feeling emptier and emptier and emptier. And through, you know, kind of my own illumination and also the um, kind of perfect timing of this book from this guy, Kamal Ravikant, who I'm about to do a podcast with. Naval or Kamal? Kamal, his brother. Okay, yeah, yeah. And the book's called Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It. Mm. And is this kind of really interesting synchronicity between that book and this experience realizing like how little I actually loved myself outside of the partners that I had. And when I recognized, I was like, Oh wow, I've gotten so, especially in the polyamorous relationship, I not only had one partner, I had multiple partners at the same time. So I was like externalizing all of the love for myself based upon the partners that I had at that time. So I loved myself because Whitney loved me mm-hmm. or Stephanie loved me or Savannah loved me or, you know, those were probably the three, you know, my three main girls that I've had in the last, you know, four years or whatever. But like that, their love was, their love was what made me love myself. It wasn't that I just love myself no matter what. Mm-hmm. I love myself because they love me. And as soon as they stopped or like shifted their love and started loving somebody else, I would get like freaked out, you know? And I would work through it, of course, and that's part of the lesson, but I never really fully understood that the reason that I was having difficulty was because I just didn't really love myself outside of their love. You know, I had externalized my love for myself in their actions and in how much they loved me. So their love was filling up my own love tank. Mm -hmm. And then I recognized like, oh, oh, well, that's a problem. Like I got to fill up my own tank. And it's something I knew, but I always thought like, oh, I'm doing pretty good. I think I love myself, Mm -hmm. but I didn't. I didn't love myself at all. Like really, it was really bad. And I think it was because I got, when you have so much external, it becomes even easier to like ignore and not follow through with the internal. I had an abundance of external love Mm -hmm. from these partners. So it was more easy to become self-reliant on it. It's like if someone is constantly, imagine somebody in a situation where, the parents are constantly giving a kid money, you know, then that kid is going to have less desire to make that money on their own. Uh-huh. And that happens in the aggregate, obviously exceptions to everything um, because they constantly have a supply from an external source. So their internal drive for that is not as strong. And I think I had this constant external source. It was, you know, always changing, of course, because well, of you're also, you're so admired by the public right? as well, right? You're getting more and more, you know, quote unquote famous every year. And I would imagine that comes with a host of, of challenges. Same deal. It's same deal. It's another place that I can get love. Mm-hmm. All of this pointing to the fact that I wasn't loving myself, Got except it. if other people love me, except if my posts did good, my girls love me, all of these other external things mostly had to do with my girls. Mm-hmm. Um, my girls are not my girls, but the girls that I was seeing. Um, and so, yeah, after at nine days, I kind of still didn't really recognize that, but I was like, I couldn't handle it anymore. So I masturbated at nine days. Cause I was like, I'm like fucking losing my mind. So I thought about all the girls I've been with and I was like, finally masturbated. And I had like some sense of peace and like did that for a couple of days. And then it finally clicked in and I was like, oh, like all of this is because I don't love myself. Wow. And then Kamal Ravikant's book, really talks about the same thing and talks about like a lot of self-love practices so that you can actually practice how to love yourself right and and that's really really valuable something that i've been doing since and i've seen my own happiness just increase exponentially and you know i've started to add in seeing other people but you know i um because i understand that self-love is the thing 
and I, it feels so much less sticky. Like I'm not judging myself based upon what's happening or what girl likes me or doesn't or what, you know, what they're doing with other things. Like everything is like, everything is so much more chill now. Mm-hmm. Cause I like, I know how to get, I know how to get love. I can give it to myself and then I can also give it to everybody else, but I don't need it back from them. You know, I can just give, I can give it to myself and I can give it to the world and I can give it to anybody I'm seeing, but I don't need it cause mm-hmm. I can fill up my own tank. So how are you giving it to yourself? Well, there's a, a couple different ways. Um, one way that I really like is really simple actually. And Kamal talks about this in his book and you on an inhale breath, you say, I love myself. And then you breathe out anything that's not that. And you do that for 10 breaths in a row. And you'll find that your mind wanders. And you're basically just creating a pattern or you're like deepening a groove. And as you do that, it gets more powerful when you can actually layer in the feeling. So like just try to layer in the feeling of actually loving yourself, like as you do it. And see how much you can get that feeling to spread like across your chest. And it's a practice. Like sometimes it's going to be hard. Um, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. And then you can do that looking in the mirror if you want. So that you're looking in your looking in your own eyes mm. and saying that we're doing the same breathing practice. And simple things like that. And then you can do a seven minute meditation where there's something you recommend seven to ten minutes where you just meditate and just practice the feeling of loving yourself just feeling love like feeling love and then another thing that's important too is you got to forgive yourself so you know kamal talks about this in his book too i talk about it all the time as well like anything that we're holding against ourselves is going to make it much harder for us to love ourselves because we're still punishing ourselves for something that we did some deficiency that we think we had because we have this idea that we should have been perfect so forgiving yourself writing everything else out that you forgive yourself for like i forgive myself for this i forgive myself for this i forgive myself for missing this opportunity i forgive myself for hurting this girl i forgive myself for not talking to my grandma before she passed i forgive myself whatever and you just forgive yourself for all that and really feel it and really say it and forgive yourself and then throw that list in the fire let it all go and just keep doing that keep forgiving and keep loving yourself keep deepening those grooves And that's going to help build your shelter to keep you stable in all these storms, especially if you're going into anything that's polyamorous, like you better build a fucking storm shelter. Right. And I didn't, you know, and I didn't. So I was getting buffered around and pummeled because I just was under the assumption that I had a strong storm shelter. I thought I loved myself. Nah, wrong. And I didn't. And that's, that's the thing. And, And you have to, I have to forgive myself for that. And I have, you know, it's just. Of course, like this and many other things, I didn't know until I knew, Mm -hmm. you know, like who I am today is still the idiot of tomorrow who I want, you know, it's like, I'm going to learn, I'm going to get smarter and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And it's a lovable idiot. Like go ahead and love your past self and just understand that past self is doing their best, but you'll be able to do better soon. Let me know if this resonates with you. A part of it for me is also how I'm treating myself like the actions I'm taking. So I know I'm not loving myself when I overbook my calendar, right? Mm -hmm. When I just, every spare minute is just full of something. And what I'm basically telling myself, this is, this is the story I have is that I am not good enough. And so I need to have all of these things on my calendar so I can grow, so I can meet new people so that I can X, Y, and Z. And I don't leave any time for myself. The other is when I don't exercise like I know I want to, I don't eat like I want to. When I treat myself and my actions follow my values, I really start to treat myself like, you know, my wife or someone that I actually do love. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things, again, I'm I'm fresh off reading Kamal's book and I'm podcasting with him on Wednesday, but one of the things he, the questions he has you ask is if I really truly loved myself, Mm -hmm. would I do this? Mm. Or would I not? Mm. If I really truly love myself, would I do this or would I not? Well, if I really truly love myself, would I book my schedule completely full? No, probably not. You know, I'm probably doing that because I'm that makes me love myself more if I'm doing more things. But if I already really truly love myself, I wouldn't do that. You know, so like if I really truly love myself, would I eat this meal this way? Well, would I eat this? Would I go work out? Like you can ask that question and that can be your kind of guide star. Like act as if you really loved yourself and then practice really loving yourself. Yeah. 
That's, that's phenomenal. And I think when you ask that type of question, you have to let it sit with you for a second. Sure. You can't let the intellect answer that one because yeah. the intellect always wants oh, more, it'll more, trick more. you. Yeah, yeah. It'll trick you right away. So I th the, the reason I ask this next question is because I think the way that you have handled you and Whitney breaking up has been really exemplary. And so anyone that is seen as having skill or talent or even having like some sort of expert status in a category, uh, I think it can be really painful to have like a mistake or a failure and then to own that and to talk about it. But you and Whitney broke up and you've been super open about that. How, what is it like for you to have so many people looking to you as um, kind of a relationship expert? I mean, I'm sitting here having this entire conversation with you because of it. And then to have this, what some people might be, might deem a failure. What's that like for you? Well, I don't look at it as a failure. That's the thing. Like, and I think that's a huge, huge mistake that mm -hmm. people make. They think a relationship is a success if it lasts forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's bullshit. Mm -hmm. Like a relationship is two people coming together to learn and do experience and to hopefully grow and have fun along the way. Right. But that could be any length of time. That could be one date. That could be one year. That could be a lifetime. It doesn't matter. But the question is like, are you growing? Are you teaching each other to love yourself more? You know, are you becoming codependent where you're just dependent upon each other's love? Are you guys co-creating something that's positive together? And I think the answer for me and Whitney is that we definitely had some deep challenges. We've made tons of mistakes. Like this whole polyamorous thing, you know, it was like we were going in pretty blind mm -hmm. and we learned a ton about ourselves and about our partner and about each other and about all that and made pretty much every mistake you could make. Um, but we learned and we had fun and, you know, the relationship no longer made sense in the construct of a relationship at a certain point and we had to acknowledge that and that wasn't easy it wasn't like ah okay let's do this you know like it was there's hard and ugly parts to all of this and there's times where i've gotten angry there's times where she's gotten angry there's times where you know there's been dishonesty there's times like we, we've made all the mistakes we've done all the things but ultimately we both deeply love and appreciate each other mm -hmm. for everything we've brought into each other's lives and we also don't abide by the societal rules like thinking that that was a failure right because we're both so much better from that relationship and also we're both still really close like my best friend is my ex-fiance caitlin you know and we're we were together six seven years like all these rules about like and we haven't been intimate in nine eight years or whatever you know the whole time i was with whitney like mm -hmm. we ne when we'll never cross that bridge again but that's fine we're friends and like me and whitney are still in this kind of interesting area where we're still hanging out every once in a while, still deeply committed to our friendship, but also know that we don't wanna be in a relationship, partly because she has a pretty evolved relationship with one of her other guys, and um, and partly because we just need space and time, and it's the relationship was, the necessity for it to evolve was there. And we've still been learning through the process, like new things are uncovered, you know, and like, I'll be in a deep meditation and I'll be like, fuck it. Like I need to, I'll have the, like a deep urge to go apologize to her about something that I haven't apologized to her about. I was like, Hey, like I know that, you know, I proposed to you and I gave you that ring and I know when I didn't follow up about, you know, wedding plans, I know how much that must've hurt. And I just want to say like deeply, like, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. you know, and like stuff that, maybe I, I just never, you'll start to realize stuff and then you'll go say that and she'll be like, oh, wow. Like, you know, thank you for saying that. And then she'll say, she'll find something else that she's like, you know, I'm realizing this about myself. I didn't express my truth to you in this way. And uh, I just want to say, I'm sorry for not expressing my truth in mm -hmm. that way or like considering your feelings in that way. Or I'm like, hey, thank you. Like, I appreciate that. And so we're still kind of learning and kind of reviewing and, um, and growing as people so but again you know i mean we've tried to be as transparent as possible about this process but you know we're not going to put a uh dramatic steady cam in the middle of when we're you know in an argument or something sure. like that and but know that that happens you know know that like as much as we're you know 
have gone through and put ourselves in really challenging situations, you know, and I guess that's why if anybody wanted to call us an expert, it would just be because we've put ourselves in really difficult situations. And we've talked to a lot of people, particularly Whitney. She's done now hundreds of coaching calls for different people. Um, and her podcast is everything really devoted to that. Uh, but I've also worked with people in my mastermind in, in a variety of different ways. Um, but really, it comes from the personal experience of like, how do you deal with this shit? Like, how do you deal with something that's extraordinarily hard? Um, and so that's kind of where we get the get the wisdom from. It's just a willingness to put ourselves in challenging spots and then find the truth and just be relentlessly um, committed to expressing that truth. Wow, that's beautiful. It's such an important topic because at some point in our lives, almost every one of us is going to go through a breakup. And because of that, uh, I don't know, stigma or definition that we put on a breakup as being a failure, I think it makes it really hard to do that gracefully. Mm -hmm. But you have you seem to have managed to really do that. Do you have any more words of wisdom on how people can, um, can break up gracefully without and, and kind of maintain the relationship? Yeah, you know, um, the, uh, it's, there's actually, uh, I actually helped Whitney work on a guide, um, for like actually on breaking up because it's one of the things that I think people struggle with the most. Mm -hmm. Um, and if anybody's interested in that guide, you can go to Whitney's website. I think it's, uh, Whitney and love, Whitney and love.com or wit and love.com. Um, it's a brand new site, but, um, I've kind of helped work on this guide with her and I think it's really good, but ultimately I think you want to be honest and really like, I think a big issue with breakups is that they, a lot of tension gets built up from not expressing your truth. And it's like, it's like loading a powder keg with the shot. Mm. And then when the shot comes out, it's either a fucking surprise, like surprise, I've been feeling this way and now we're breaking up. Mm -hmm. Like that sucks. You know, like much, much better would have been to, you know, express it earlier on and talk about it. And then a lot of times people just will lose courage and like they'll know they'll know what's right. Like, man, I just know I need to break up, but you won't they won't do it because they're too attached or too codependent or too into the comfort of the situation. So it's just honoring your truth and expressing your truth in the most loving way mm -hmm. and then being mindful of acting out of like deep emotion too because when you're in like a really emotionally turbulent space like you're going to think differently when you're not that emotional so just don't do anything you know like don't do anything out of like a really strong emotion i've never done anything out of a really strong emotion that i'm like nailed it that was a great choice great choice <laughs> fucking i was super angry was eight out of ten <laughs> super angry and i just delivered the perfect message yeah. no because eventually you become <clears throat> not angry and you're like fuck i was a jackass mm -hmm. you know and so just trying to like have the temperance to know that if there's these feelings coming up be comfortable taking some space like hey i need a little space mm -hmm. you know and if you're really feeling something instead of like exploding and ejaculating your anger onto somebody like take a little space like let it out you know somewhere else safely and um and then try to like try to speak from as calm and and authentic and loving a place as you can because mm. obviously you guys do love each other you know and that's the truth and all the pain comes from really love and our reactions to that love if you didn't love if you were apathetic it would be easy so in order to do that we have to have some sort of we have to like value that relationship going beyond breaking up so it takes a commitment to continue being in a relationship with this person to take some space to regulate our emotions, et cetera, right? What's the value for you in maintaining a relationship with Whitney or other relationships after they've, after they're no longer your primary partner? Well, there's other things that, you know, hopefully you have fun, mm -hmm. you know, and like, so let's take Whitney, for example, like she's one of the funnest people I've ever met, you know, whether it's we're out wake surfing or whether we're out dancing or whether we, you know, we recently went to a Houston Texans game and she's just like hooting and hollering and just having the best time. She's just fun mm -hmm. to hang out with. So even just being friends and hanging out and doing stuff is still really fun. Um, we also get to talk about like really interesting things like she's on her own, you know, journeys of exploration. She's working with Wednesday Martin, uncovering different aspects of 
and working with different clients for for relationship stuff i'm focusing on a lot of mindset stuff i'm about to start writing my next book and we're all both interested in the spiritual path you know she recently did ayahuasca i'm about to go to this darkness retreat there's a lot of things that we can share and you know there's just a deep friendship that's formed over eight years of our intimacy um and yeah the intimacy may come here and there but it's about not putting the pressure on that thing to make it and, and us being mindful that we have to be careful not to get in that situation that we're going to become codependently attached to each other's love again and so that's kind of just the place we're in where we're just being mindful like all right we did the polyamorous thing it's really fucking hard she's got you know a really well-established relationship that is still polyamorous but like it's just about just being mindful and giving that giving that plenty of space mm -hmm. uh, but not having to sacrifice everything and if we do have to sacrifice everything because it's just too fucking hard well we'll make that choice but mm -hmm. at this point maintaining the friendship and and enjoying uh you know enjoying spending time with each other is the place that we're in i love it man thank you so much for your time dude i appreciate course, you um just the openness and the authenticity that you talk about this taboo, but such important topic. Yeah. Um, where's the best p place for people? Like what, what do you want people to know about like the content that you're putting out or places like what's the best place to follow you? I think there's really uh, three things. One, um, follow me on Instagram at Aubrey Marcus. I'm always posting different things. Um, my different thoughts or different things that's going on. Uh, my newsletter, which is really mostly like a weekly diary. It's where I get really intimate about everything that's mm. going on that week for me. So if you go to aubreymarks.com, you can sign up for that and you'll hear all the stories. It used to be a lot more about relationships when I was mm. going through the turbulence of that. Um, but as I'm going on my different journeys, you'll be able to tap in and see that. And then of course my podcast, you know, that's, um, you know, one of the things that I'm the most proud of and I enjoy the most. So that's the Aubrey Marcus podcast. So any one of those three or all three, you know, it is a great play, great way to keep up with me. Awesome, man. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, brother. This episode is brought to you by Working Against Gravity or WAG. WAG does one-on-one -on -one nutrition coaching to help you lose weight, lose body fat, perform better in the gym, and also just to help you feel more comfortable and confident in your own skin. WAG also trains people to become nutrition coaches themselves and to start online nutrition businesses. So this one is special for me because I am the director of marketing and the president of WAG. My wife started the company about five years ago. And what I admire and respect about her and her team most is that the number one value and focus of attention at the company has always been on the coaching service itself. So even after reaching 2000 members, when they could have focused more on marketing or selling more things, they continue to make the coaching service better and better and better. And that's why so many people get amazing results. I think we have something like close to a thousand testimonials and transformation photos on our website that you can check out and such a high number such a high percentage of people get amazing results on this program and that's because the main focus point of attention on the comp uh, of the entire company has been on making the coaching service better so what you get when you sign up is first and foremost accountability you get a real human being an expert on nutrition science and the art of coaching that will be with you every step of the way holding your hand through the entire process you get education through our uh, members only knowledge base. You get access to a private members Facebook group. And when you sign up, you'll fill out a questionnaire. We'll get to know you. We'll create, we'll then pair you with the coach that best suits your personality and your experience. And then they will create a custom nutrition plan. They will send this through our software system seismic and week over week, you will communicate with your coach uh, through a weekly check-in. You'll log what you're eating. If that's what your coach wants you to do, you will give them a summary each week. And then every single time you check in, they will give you strategies and tips for how to overcome your unique challenges or obstacles in your nutrition. I've been a client myself for many, many years, and I've tried just about every diet in the world. And I can truly genuinely say that this thing works. Um, this coach is 
someone that will be in your corner, is supportive, is really rooting for you, and has done done this with hundreds or thousands of people before. So whatever your obstacles are, I can almost guarantee that if you're willing to put in the effort and uh, really go after it, then you can get the results that you're after. So again, if you go to workingagainstgravity.com and enter the code BRUTE50, that's B-R-U-T-E 50 at checkout, you'll get $50 off of your first month of membership. Also, if you want to become a nutrition coach yourself because your life has been transformed by uh, nutrition or a nutrition coach and you just really want to give back and you want to join the digital workforce, then you can join our wait list right now at workingagainstgravity.com. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Your journey towards better fitness continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com to connect with Michael and his guests. Access links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive to podcast listeners. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com.